Hey, what's going on? My name's Robert, and you are watching Southpaw Auto Works. This is the GM Turbo 400. This video is all about the assembly of the clutch packs. Andy is gonna be walking you through the basics. He'll also be including some tips and tricks along the way. Without further ado, let's get this show on the road. Okay, so we've got a Turbo 400 here torn down. We're gonna show you how to build this, show you a few uh, tips and tricks on some things that I've learned over the years on building these. Uh, I do wanna point out a couple of things before we get too far on our clutches, which are new, and the bands, both are new. We have not soaked these in transmission fluid, but you definitely wanna do that for about 15 to 30 minutes before you assemble this. This unit is not one that I'm gonna actually be using to go in a vehicle. We're just gonna use this for demonstration, but I'm gonna show you everything you need to know to build it. Just wanna let you know that you definitely have gotta soak those beforehand, as well as both of the bands. And I do recommend you put both bands in new, along with the clutches. Another thing I'm not gonna go through, because we don't wanna turn this video into too long a one, is I am gonna recommend most of the bushings get replaced We've got a bushing kit here. I'll show you some of the ones that are most critical, but we're not gonna take the time to actually press out all the old bushings and the, and the new bushings. Once again, very time consuming. Thought we'd uh, shorten the video up a little bit. So um, some of the parts are not gonna be as clean as I would normally use. Once again, we just wanna use this for assembly purposes, show you the, the video and so forth. So a couple other things. Just to start with, a couple of the thrust washers that go in this unit, okay? When you take the unit apart, you're gonna notice these two four-tang washers, okay? One is plastic, one is a steel back bronze. Um, some of them may have two steel back bronzes, whatever the case may be. My recommendation, throw those away, get fresh ones. You can see the surface on this one is worn pretty good. A lot of people don't like the plastic washers. They do actually work pretty good, but well, we're gonna put in two new steel back bronze washers to replace those. Also, we're gonna be putting in all new bearings. You'll notice if you had yours apart, you've got two three-piece Torrington bearings that go in this unit. I'm gonna show you how to install those in the correct direction. Just notice one thing here real quick and why I'd recommend putting a new set of bearings in. Here's your old bearing, here's your new bearing replacement, okay? Much heavier duty, a lot more rollers in there. Another good reason to replace that bearing set. It's cheap enough, it's good insurance, just replace them while you're in there. Um, also, there's a couple of other washers in the unit. As I go, I'll show you where these go, okay? Uh, this plastic one can also be replaced with a steel back bronze, a little heavier. And in this case, what I'm gonna use is a thicker washer in place of that. Most of your thrust washers are about 60 thousandths of, a, of an inch. This one is 90. This is made by an aftermarket company. Need parts and tools for your Turbo 400 rebuild? We got you covered. Check out the resources section in the video description down below. And that's going to help us with, with what we call our end play, the movement of all the components back and forth in the unit. Okay, so not only do we upgrade from plastic to steel back bronze, we also go a little thicker, take up some of the clearance in there. So I'll show you that as we go and where they go so you'll know exactly where each one of these is positioned. I've got most of the unit laid out. I've got part of the gasket and seal kit here laid out. Okay, most of you are gonna wanna know where all these seals go and how to figure out which position they go in. Okay, I've separated them out. You can do the same thing here. You'll notice you've got a couple of the uh, lip seals here that are the same size. You've got three total that are near the same size. One's a little bit smaller, okay? Both of your pistons that come out of the clutch drums, these two forward and direct are the same diameter. So very simple there. We've got two that match. So therefore we know those go on the outside of those pistons, okay? Inside the same thing. Inside diameter is the same thing between the forward and direct. Okay, we've got two small seals here. Those will go on the pistons as well. I'll go ahead and feed those on there. Remember, when you're putting the piston, the uh, lip seals on these pistons. Okay, the lip itself is going to face down 
into the drum. So when you install the piston into the drum, the lip is going to be facing down so that when the pressure hits it, it's going to push it out to help it seal. Okay, that's how you know which direction it faces. One thing that will confuse you slightly on this though, is each of these drums also has an inner seal that go into drum itself here. Okay, you notice that probably when you took it apart. Difference being the lip on that is gonna face up like that towards you, okay? I'll explain that a little bit later, but just so you know, that lip seal does not face down. It faces back up towards you in that direction. So both of those are the same once again. Easy for those to be determined. They'll go in here just like that. Let me get these on and then he can get a shot. If you can see that. Good, okay. So that's your forward drum. That's the one with the input shaft. We put the inner seal for the drum there. We take our outer piston seals, put those on both of the pistons. Now these pistons do have a specific drum to be installed into, okay? And I'm gonna explain that to you. This is what I do. I get both seals installed on there. I take my fingers and run it across there to make sure that they're into the groove all the way and that there's no damage or that the seal's flipped or something in the groove itself. It's just a little habit that I have. I run across like that. So we've got our other one here. What do we do with our other seal? That one in there, that direct drum seal is going to go in there. Once again, make sure that inner lip faces up towards us for both the forward and direct drums. Okay, that's going to leave you with one seal once we get these on. Once again, checking those. Okay, you're going to put one on your intermediate piston. Now, see there, we've already mixed them up. That's not a good fit. Okay, let's take this one back off. Lay them back out again. If you can see all this or not, okay. Got two here. Those were our two that were the same. We've already put one on wrong here. Let's pull this one back out. Looks like I mixed them up as we went, so. That one's a little bit smaller in diameter, hard to see. All right. That goes on here. These two, as I mixed them up, as I was talking, go on those. So this is our intermediate piston, fits there. And then he's got an inner lip seal that goes here. Once again, both of the lips facing down. So when that's installed, not into a drum, but into the center support itself, both of the lips will face down like that into the drum itself. Two seals on the piston, nothing in that drum or center support itself. Now we'll go back, correct these. Once again, these are the same. And this guy. Now you're gonna notice a little difference in the pistons. Okay, check those. One of them has a check ball in it. Okay, that check ball must be free. Just a simple little whack on there, a little bit of brake clean, make sure that it's free in there. That's a little bleed hole that has to be in there, okay? That has to be matched with the proper drum because once again, same size piston, same height on the piston, okay? And they can vary. That's gonna depend on the engine size application and so forth and determine how many clutches are gonna go in a clutch pack. But you've noticed one, has what appears to be a check ball, but it's not. It's just a little hole in there, okay? That's gotta go with the proper drum. How, how do we know which drum it goes in? Here's your forward drum. What does that have? It's got a check ball in it, okay? So this guy takes the piston without the check ball, okay? We don't double up on check balls, okay? So that's gonna go in that drum. This guy with the check ball. Notice inside the drum, no check ball. So that matches with this guy right here. We've matched up our third one here to go with the 
center support. You'll also notice got a couple of seals left over here. Okay. This was an early Turbo 400 design, this strange looking seal. It's flat on one side. It's got a little taper on the other side right there. That was used on the early Turbo 400 drum inside in here in the forward drum itself where we put that lip seal. That was updated. Why they still throw it in the kit, I don't know. But that guy goes in the trash, doesn't get used. Last one, a square cut seal. No lip on that. That's gonna go on your servo piston here, okay? Right here, okay? So that guy will go on there. Now I've taken the old seals off this inner piston and I saved them for a minute, okay? I had to actually cut those off. They're like a Teflon type seal. Those are gonna get replaced by a metal seal or seals, what we would call sealing rings. So those go away. We've got a metal ring goes on the outside diameter of the piston. It's a non-locking style or what we call a butt style. You simply have to put that in there, squeeze it, and install it into that piston. Okay, don't force it in there. You'll break that ring. It's a kind of a brittle piece. Inner one now is gonna be a locking type ring. That's gonna go, take this back out so you can see it on there. Feed it over, lock the ring, and you're set. That's known as a one-two accumulator piston, okay? So once again, outer metal, put that back on there. I would clean these up better if it were actually a unit that we were gonna build. I wouldn't put something together that dirty. A Little bit of assembly lube or something in there is good. That sets in there. And then the big fat spring that you have that's loose sets in there. All right, that will show us the rest of the assembly on later. If this content is adding value, please let us know by hitting that like button. It does help the channel and we do greatly appreciate your feedback. Next step I wanna show you is getting these seals to go down in the drum because you'll notice if you try and put that in, it's just gonna get caught in there. You've got snap ring groove to deal with up here in the top of the drum that those that inner lip seal is gonna get caught on. You've got the outer lip of the drum here that the outer seal or lip seal's gotta go past, okay? There are some aftermarket and factory tools available that look like a big cone that can compress that lip seal for you and allow you to slide that down in. If you've ever seen somebody in, uh, assemble an engine at a machine shop or something, they've got a tapered cone they set in there and they can simply drop that piston in. Not gonna happen for us here. What we've gotta do is lube these up real good, lube the drum up, and then we can use one of the cheapest tools out there is this one they made by uh, TransTech Lip Wizard. And I'll show you how that works. Let me get this drum lubed up. And this is another product right here, by the way, that I recommend. Makes it real easy to assemble these things, okay? We've got this and we've got some assembly lube that's also, both of these are compatible with uh, transmission fluid. So, this stuff's got the handy brush, a little bit on the lip seal, a little bit on the inner drum, piston, a little bit on the outer. Now, once again, I'm gonna work these seals now with my fingers to help kind of compress them a little bit. If you're real good at this and you work at it long enough and you're fast enough, you can actually get this to drop in the drum without even using another tool or any other assistance. Okay, I'm just gonna work that a little bit. I'm gonna set it down in here and I'm gonna start with the inner seal and I'm gonna take this guy and I'm gonna work it in there around that piston. I wanna put light pressure on the piston as I'm going together and work this around. I'm already past the snap ring groove on the inner. So I'm in pretty good shape there. We've still got to work on the outer one. And what you do is just work this around lightly. You don't want to force it down in there because you can damage the lip seal if you get too carried away with the, with the pressure on it. But anyway, I think we've got it far enough. It's gonna drop in there. Yep, we've dropped all the way to the base of the drum itself. 
And of course it doesn't hurt, maybe flashlight or something, look down in there, make sure you didn't chunk a piece of that uh, lip seal off of there, okay? Now, I'm gonna show you on this drum, uh, we won't go through it on this one, it's the exact same thing that I just did for this drum, but I will show you the final assembly for these. <clears throat> We've got a set of springs, by the way, the forward and direct springs are the same, okay? So simply take a stack of those, fill up all the pockets, in the drum, in the piston itself. And it's not that unusual sometimes to see a couple of springs missing. They'll do that from the factory sometimes. And what'll happen is you'll see something like that. Okay, so if you end up short on springs, don't freak out, you don't have to put springs in every pocket. It's just kind of a hit or miss deal. Sometimes they'll have a full set, sometimes they won't, okay? <clears throat> Both of the retainers for these drums are the same for the springs. So you can put either one in. And then we've got two snap rings, gonna be the same also, go in either drum, okay? Like I said, I'm not gonna go through the trouble of showing you that one right now. Uh, we want to keep the video as short as possible. So I'm going to set that aside. We'll compress that in a minute. Let's do the same thing with our other piston, the intermediate, both lip seals facing down. Once again, we've got to get past a snap ring groove and this outer edge. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll lube them up. Now notice here, doesn't hurt to work these down once again with your fingers. What we're gonna run into though is we cannot access that outer seal. You see the lip on this piston itself. So when we're installing this, we can't work that inner seal. It's kind of tough to get to at least with this thing straight down. You could try and get it from the edge. Usually if you work the inner seal in first, once again, a little bit of pressure on the piston. Sometimes I rotate it a little bit. Okay. Usually, now my hand's so slick I can't get it turned. Usually you can get that to drop in there. If not, what I do is I'll take a dull piece such as the backside of one of these picks or a real dull screwdriver or something, and I'll work that in here to help push that lip seal in from the outside. Okay, we're starting to, there we're going, okay. Now, you may have to twist this piston slightly. If you notice, I can only rotate it back and forth a little bit. That's because these spring pockets stick down into a pocket in the center support. So you must rotate it until it drops all the way in. You'll notice the piston here is flush with the support. Now, here's one that's gonna really throw you for a loop, because that's all you're gonna find when you take this thing apart, is three springs, okay? but you've got four, eight, 12 pockets, and that screws a lot of people up and they think they lost springs or somebody threw them out before. Not the case. That's all it uses, three springs. Where do you put them? Spread them out anywhere you like, pretty much, as long as they're kind of evenly spaced. Put it in the second pocket, third, whatever way you want. Doesn't really make any difference on these, okay? As long as you've got even pressure, those are to return that piston when it's not applied. And this guy's got a big, washer looking retainer that sits on there and that snap ring. Don't really need the spring compressor for this job. If you're able to get that, you can usually push it down with your fingers, spread the snap ring with pliers or just rotate it, pretty easy, okay? These, we're gonna show you how to set that up in a press or something or whatever way you can manage because obviously we've got too much pressure to work with there. We can't hold that down. So we show you a uh, spring compressor to do that. And do your press. Okay, 
So we've got one of our clutch packs over here in the press. In this case, we're just using an Arbor press, which is probably overkill for compressing the springs, but we just want to show you the basic idea behind this. Whatever way you can set it up to compress these is good, obviously. So we've got a little homemade tool here to set down on the retainer. We'll bring our Arbor press down and get it started. We've got the snap ring already kind of sitting here for us. And what we've got to do is get this compressed far enough to expose the snap ring groove and probably not get any more carried away than that because the arbor press will damage the spring. So I'm going to try and lock that in place so I don't have to hold it. And then snap ring pliers, spread the snap ring. We don't want to get carried away here either. Enough to make it over the drum, but don't be gorilla with it and stretch it out too far. Now, if you can see it or not here, we're not into the groove all the way. So what I'm gonna do is loosen this up, recompress it just slightly, okay, and we'll probably see that snap ring pop in there. See? Another thing too, notice the opening on the snap ring here, okay? We do not want it in the position it's in right now. We wanna rotate it around. We can do that just by spinning it, okay? Why? Because we want the opening of the snap ring between these two little guys right here. What's that gonna do? Notice when the retainer comes up, that's gonna help hold that snap ring in the groove because centrifugal forces as the drum is spinning is gonna wanna walk that snap ring out of there and we don't want that to happen. So just a little detail that the factory did to try and hold that snap ring in the groove. It was a little hard to see what was going on there. So here's a better vantage point on this. The spring retainer, it's outfitted with four of these bumps. Position the opening of the snap ring between any two of these bumps, just like so, and you'll be good to go. I'm not gonna do the other drum as I mentioned because it's the exact same. We're gonna try and keep this short and sweet best we can. All right, so we've got our uh, piston with the seals. We've got the return springs retainer snap ring in, okay? Uh, we can start stacking clutches, but I do want to show you on the back side of the direct drum, which is what they call that. We do have some more assembly to do here. Okay, we've got a one-way clutch on the back of this. Okay, I'm going to recommend you replace it with a new one. Okay, and yes, it is important which way this installs. Okay, you can go this way or this way. On this particular style, what we call a spring and roller type one-way clutch, there's also a sprag style that was used on these, okay? You'll notice some ramps right here, okay? And the little ramp is kind of corresponded on this inner part of that sprag itself or one-way clutch, okay? So if we go to install it, we can almost see that it doesn't fit quite right that way. Kind of makes it dummy proof, but not perfect, all right? We flip it over, and if you can get a good shot of that, you'll notice that that ramp is mimicked on the shape of that inner part of that one-way clutch. And that sometimes installs that easily, sometimes doesn't. All right, get it on there. Here. Okay. Usually once it's installed correctly, you'll notice it will move freely. And of course the ramp on there corresponds to the ramp on the inner part of that roller clutch. Okay. We're going to double check the direction of that once we put the outer race on, as soon as I find it anyway. There it is. Right underneath. So you've got what was called the outer race to the one-way clutch that goes on there. Okay. Put that on, rotate it, okay? And what'll happen is you'll work the little rollers and the springs there. What's gonna happen is you're gonna push the rollers against the springs, okay? What does that do? It moves the roller to a larger part of the ramp, okay? Allows that to be installed, simple as that, okay? The Sprague style, uh, we'll have to dig one of those up for you and show you that also is a little tougher to install. But what we're gonna do now is check direction of rotation because it's just that, it's a one-way clutch, allows the drum to turn in one direction, locks it, does not allow it to turn the other direction. How do we know which way is correct? 
This is the way the drum installs into the transmission, just down like that, okay? Engine rotation is clockwise. That means this drum should freewheel clockwise, lock counterclockwise, okay? Hold the outer race with your hand. Drum should turn clockwise, looking at it straight down like that, just like a clock turns, okay? Try and turn it counterclockwise, she locks. That's the correct installation, okay? This roller style is a little tougher to put on backwards, but it can be forced on there incorrectly, and as well as the sprag goes on very simply either direction, and you can definitely make a mistake on that. So remember, engine rotation, clockwise freewheel, it's gonna lock counterclockwise, okay? Finish the installation of that, it's got a little retainer, a couple tangs on that, goes on there. Snap ring, use your pliers or just rotate it in place. All right. That's it for the back side of that for the one-way clutch. Okay, we want to show you the other style of one-way clutch here. So we've got a separate drum from the one we built in the unit itself that had the spring and roller type one-way clutch in it. I wanted to show you the option, if you will, the other one that they also used in the 400. And this is known as the Sprague type one-way clutch, little different design than the spring and roller. This is the very early design where it only had 16 total of these elements, wherein the spring and roller type would be the rollers in place of those, okay? And this is the one that we can install upside down or backwards very easily because there's no ramps or anything for it to locate in there. So we can put it on one way, we can flip it over the other way very easily which is gonna create a big time problem for us. So I wanna show you how to put it on properly. Also, this being the early 16 element, I would highly recommend if you have the Sprague type, you wanna upgrade because they make a 34 element Sprague to go in this much beefier, much stronger, definitely the one you wanna go with, not this early style here. And just in case, because I assume most people or many people are wondering, what is a one-way clutch? Well, we showed you kind of how it operated, but grab your ratchet out of your toolbox, okay? That's a one-way clutch right there, okay? Free wheels one direction, locks in the other, okay? Simple as that. So, installation on the Sprague type, usually what's best or I found easiest is to take the Sprague, set it on the outer race, and then you use one of the end caps and you simply roll it down in there. Okay, other end cap is already in place. Put this over the drum, rotate it, okay? Second end cap, retainer, and snap ring, just like the other style, spring and roller. Let's check this and see if we've got it right. Drum installs this direction down into the case. We should freewheel clockwise, lock counterclockwise while holding that outer race. So we've got that right. Just so that you know, for diagnosis purposes, if you put that in backwards, okay, on the one-two shift, you would have a free wheel. You would not have a one-two shift, okay? It would not lock, therefore you would not have that upshift, okay? When you went to shift to third gear or the transmission attempted to shift to third gear, it would try and lock it up, bind it up, okay? So that's one you gotta be real careful with on installation. Okay, just wanted to show you that too so that you have all the info, show you both styles of drums. Okay, so what we need to do next here is stack some clutches in this clutch pack, okay? And this can vary a little bit from model to model, year to year, engine size and so forth. And that, what I mean by that is the number of frictions and steels that will fit into this clutch pack. The drums themselves pretty much stayed the same. The height of the pistons did change on certain models. And if you were requiring or wanted to put more clutches in here, you could put a different piston, which would be shorter and allow you to stack more clutches in there. Most of these held five steels and five frictions, which is more than adequate for most applications. Also, the steels, that go into the clutch pack are available in at least two different thicknesses, sometimes three or more, depending on where you buy them, okay? Generally speaking, this clutch pack normally use the thicker of the steels. The forward drum itself 
normally have the thinner steels, but they can be swapped back and forth. They'll fit fine. It'll all work. Okay. We just need to get the correct number in there and get the clearance set so we know it'll work properly. Clearance is our, is our final goal. Okay. So what we're going to do is pick out some steels. I've got some new, some used. Far cheaper time-wise just to buy a new set of steels and put them in there. You notice kind of a shiny finish on these from a used transmission. Okay, not a desirable finish, at least not to go in the direct clutch pack. I wouldn't have a problem putting them in here. This is not a shifting clutch. This is an application clutch. This is one that's used during shifting. I like to see fresh steels put in there. Sometimes guys will uh, sand these, zing them down, whatever the case may be. Your choice, but I just recommend grabbing new steels and go with it. Once again, we did not soak the frictions, but I do recommend that. I'd never put them in there dry. Okay. Now, one unique thing about the Turbo 400, there's only a few other transmissions besides this trans, that use a wave plate. So this first steel plate, which goes down in against a piston on the Turbo 400 is a wavy steel. If you look at it straight on, you'll see that it's actually waved and not flat. That's known as a cushion plate, okay? And those are put in from the factory. I recommend reusing them. Some guys toss them out, put a flat steel in. The idea behind this is, is that steel plate has to flatten out as the clutch is applied. That slows the application down, makes for a little softer shift. Yes, we can still make it shift hard, even with these in the, in the trans. Got to remember, this is known as a direct clutch. It's used in third and reverse. Do you want it to bang going into reverse? I don't think so. So that's the reason I put the wave plate back in, okay? Garage shift going in reverse, gonna bang your head, you start leaving these out and go with flat steels. Put this back in is what I recommend. One of the few, by the way, that actually takes a friction on top of a wave plate. You'll see in some of the other videos, which we hope to do for you soon, they do use wave plates, but they put a steel flat plate on top of it first, and then the first friction. Okay, 400's a little different. Wave plate down first, friction, and then simply alternate. Okay, we'll see this should probably take five total. Okay, we've got five steels, five frictions in there, which is pretty much standard on a Turbo 400. And then you've got your thickest plate, which is known as the pressure plate. Goes opposite the piston on top. Notice this is directional. You've got the surface here for the clutch to ride against. Not gonna work so good that way. So flat side down, okay. Set down in there. We need a snap ring to go in there. Both of the clutch pack snap rings, forward and direct, are the same snap rings, so those can interchange, okay? They're a little smaller than pretty much the rest of the snap rings, okay? We've got a couple that go in for the center support, it's a little smaller than that. The only one that's smaller altogether is the one that goes in the back of the planetary gear set. And if we put that in there, we see that's not going to work, so we can eliminate those. Take this snap ring, get it started in the groove, spiral it in there, take screwdriver, whatever, drop that in, make sure we have all the way in that groove itself. Now we need to check clearance, okay? We've got to have some clearance in that clutch back for it to operate properly and not overheat. And that the idea behind that is when this clutch is not applied, we don't want these friction plates to be dragging too tight against steels. Okay, got to have some clearance, allow the fluid in between there, not build too much heat. It's a real basic check here. I'm just simply taking my scribe, going down to the bottom clutch plate down there, the friction plate, and pulling up on that, okay? There's a hundred different ways to measure this. You can take a feeder blade, slide it in between the top friction and the pressure plate. You could put a dial indicator on there. You can use dial calipers, whatever the case may be. Turbo 400 is not a picky transmission as far as clutch clearances go. Here's another way, just grab the top plate. Very li little clearance there, okay? Very, very little. You can see very little movement between that friction as it moves up, okay? That's gonna be a little bit too tight. Very general rule of thumb for clutch clearances. 
you would take the number of frictions times about seven thousandths a piece. Okay? Seven times five, thirty-five thousandths. We better have a minimum of thirty-five thousandths clearance in there. Okay? Depending on which book you read, they're going to give you different variances on that. <clears throat> some thinner, some thicker. The cool thing about the 400 is every time it shifts, every time it upshifts, shifts to second, shifts to third gear, we simply apply another clutch. Okay? We don't have to release a clutch or a band. Most every other transmission out there is going to require that. So you're going to have a clutch apply and a clutch release, a clutch apply, a band release, whatever the case may be. Not in the 400, therefore the clearances are not that particular. But we do have to have a minimum amount. So we're too tight on this. What would we do to fix it? In this case, the snap rings are standard size. <coughs> the pressure plates are standard size. What we're going to do is take these out leaving the wave plate by itself, and we'll just simply put in a thinner steel here, okay? I don't know if I have any in the stack up. Yeah, I think we got a couple here. Little bit thinner steel. The fat ones, I think, are about 90, and these are about 75,000, so what we'll do is we'll just take one or two of the fat ones out, okay? Throw in a couple of the thinner uh, steels. Okay, and I'll give you an example. Let's go ahead and stick it back together just so you get an idea of what we're doing here and how it comes out. All right, so there's one we're going to throw. Now, this is a used one. I'm just using it for example so you get an idea of what we're doing here. Once again, just alternate frictions and steels. All right. There's in there. Grab our pressure plate, put it back in. Drop the snap ring in. All right, let's do a real basic check here again. All right, now we got a nice little clearance in there, okay? Like I said, one of the quickest and easiest ways, it's not the most accurate, would be to take a dial caliper, measure from the pressure plate or surface on the drum down to the first friction, then you zero the caliper and pull up on the clutches and do your measurement again, and that would give you a real quick, uh, quick clearance check on that, okay? Key on this is to be most accurate, you really need to be working both sides of the friction, okay? Not just one side. Pull up on both sides to get the most accurate. But right there, being a Turbo 400, knowing they're not that picky, we've got a decent amount of running clearance in there, I would let that fly. Okay, so one other point that I think we may or may not have covered on this forward drum, I haven't done the full assembly on it just for time time purposes, but one thing I wanted to emphasize was on our clutch stack up in that one, definitely wave plate in the bottom of that one. Hard to see in the camera, but that is a wavy plate. Definitely want to start with that wave plate against the piston, okay? And this is an unusual one of 400 compared to others. Friction does go against that, where normally in most transmissions you're going to have a flat steel plate. But the stack up is the same as the direct. Once again, wave plate's there to cushion the shift. You don't want to harsh garage shift going into drive. So I highly recommend you put that back in. Don't leave them out. Okay, we're gonna show you how to do an air check on the direct clutch, okay, off the center support. Once the planetary center support is installed, the intermediate clutches are installed, we're gonna install this drum, okay, and where that's gonna sit. It's just basically right over that center support like that, okay? And to do an air check, we're using the two outer holes on the center support, okay, to apply this. GM applies this clutch in a different way for third gear as reverse gear. So they use two different feed holes, hence the three seals that were in the drum. Two on the piston, one on the drum facing up. They split the application of this clutch depending on whether you're using it for third or reverse. So we're not gonna get a perfect air check because we're gonna bleed by that inner lip seal that's in here, okay? Get a decent air check there, what sounds okay. We hear the clutch is thunking, if you will, nice little thud right there. Okay, we get a little bleed over to the other hole. Now we'll go to the one on the opposite side. That one will get a little louder because we're blowing past that inner seal that was in that drum facing up. But we still get a 
Nice little apply there, okay? We could try and plug this hole, that would help a little bit, and opposite this way too, okay? Not bad. That also can help us, by the way, get a more accurate clearance check in the clutch pack. What I would normally do is apply the clutches a few times with air, then measure my clutch clearance. Be a little bit more accurate because everything is what they call seated in there, okay? We don't want to put any air in that middle hole, okay? That's going to apply this piston right here. And without it installed in the transmission with the clutches to stop that piston, we would end up blowing one of the lip seals out. So we're going to leave that guy alone. That's the air check we do in the case once it's assembled. This show is a ton of hours to produce and we could use your support. You can learn more by checking out the video description down below. So you just got done watching the video on what it takes to assemble a clutch drum. Like Andy said, this one was about the direct clutch. However, however, you could take that same knowledge and apply it to the forward clutch. Up next, we're gonna be diving into Turbo 400 bushings. Naturally, we've got a lot more in store for you as we progress through this Turbo 400 rebuild series. So be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell too so you don't miss out on any upcoming videos. Once again, my name's Robert and I will see you next time.